The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on March 23, 2021. 12.07 a.m. I just found out that Napoleon's older brother owned an estate in New Jersey, and it's becoming a state park. What? Yes, Joseph's exile after losing the title to the King of Spain in, I want to say Naples, was in New Jersey. Apparently, people were not as afraid of him as they were Napoleon, and American elites were Francophiles and liked nobles, even if we pretended we hated royalty. That's swell. I just can't believe with my travels around the East Coast and interest in history that I had no idea he had a property in Jersey. I guess it's because it wasn't really accessible. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the brothers through yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about George Washington. Maybe we'll talk about swan boats. Maybe we'll talk about Quan Plan, the bridal chorus, abdications, Elsa of Arendelle, or Sesame Place. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. That's how it works on Things I Text My Brother. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we jump back to our text exchange to talk about a man known both for his elegance and his blandness, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quest for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus it's time for ablutions and edification. Alrighty, well today we're going to focus on an ablution. Although we've been perfect in many episodes, we weren't in one of our recent episodes. Brad, what type of ablution do you have for us today? Well, much like Joseph Bonaparte, I was a bit of a failure and a disappointment. Don't say that. In episode 18, Whales Chomping Humans and Miniature Golf on Calvary, I rightly and astutely noted that my math was crap in the bonus ending of the episode. Indeed, and you were the best mathematician in the family. But it was even more crappy than I thought. Bring it. I said that 365 days times 5 years would be 1,835, because I was doing the math in my head. I was wrong. Hmm. It would have been 1,825. Uh. So to my eternal shame, not only did I forget to add leap years in there, which you corrected me on, I just plain biffed on the math. So it wouldn't have been 1825. Would not have been. It would have been 1826 or 1827. Right. You got it. Uh. So I totally blew it. I'm clearly no Will Hunting or Ted Kaczynski, but that's what it is. <laughs> Probably closer to the latter than the former. Probably. You are cleansed. Well done. Yep. Well, Brother Brad, now that you have cleansed yourself of your mathematical sins, what do you have to tell us about this whole Joseph Bonaparte in New Jersey subject? You stated that it was out of the way, and maybe that's why you've never heard of it. I, for a fact, came within 20 miles of Breeze Point, the estate mm. that Joseph Bonaparte lived in. When I went to Sesame Place with my children in Langhorn, Pennsylvania... Joseph Bonaparte's house overlooked Sesame Place? A mere 20 miles away, so if it was on a high enough hill, maybe it did. So I don't know how close you came. If you've been in Trenton, you were probably a little bit closer than I have been. Well, I've been in Philadelphia many times, and I've been through Trenton. I used to take the train up through that corridor all the time. So I've been right around his house, just never in a position to go and visit the grounds. Mm. Well, Napoleon, as you know, named himself leader of France after the revolution at some point. So 1804, he became emperor. Mm, and I actually named myself Napoleon in French class circa 1993. Yeah, when I was in high school and I picked my name for Spanish class, my name was Carlos Jose Mendes Pedro Francisco Vargas. That's a winner. And uh, I wrote it on every single paper because the Spanish teacher, Mr. Adams, <laughs> was convinced that I would give it up. But for all four years, I wrote that on every single paper. Our French teacher told me that Napoleon wasn't a choice, but for four years, that's the name I wrote. So Napoleon was the leader of France, but he was actually from Corsica. Yeah. And the year that he was born on Corsica was not even part of France. 
It was a republic. It was its own republic. Yeah. Until 1755, they were part of Genoa. Mm -hmm. And then they became their own republic. And then 1768, they became part of France because... Genoa used troops and money from France to fight against the Corsicans, mm. the revolution in Corsica. And then when they couldn't pay them back, they just gave them Corsica, which was now an independent country, and said, here you go in payment of debts. You can just have the place that we borrowed money to fight against, which I find fascinating. And I was trying to think of what a, a comparison would be for us. It occurred to me it would be like if the U.S. had actually helped Mexico suppress the revolution in Texas as opposed to aid it. Mm hmm. And at the end, Mexico's like, well, now we can't pay you back. Here you go. Have Texas. And then 35 years later, Sam Houston's son becomes president of the United States. That would be like what the comparison would be. Interesting. I'm going to try the next time I have a debt. I wish I hadn't paid off my college loans because I would have just gone over to the former Mount Union College, now the University of Mount Union. And I would have said, here, have put in bay. <laughs> Uh, in order to understand this topic at all, which was going back to the original text, just talking about the fact that Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's older brother, ends up living in the United States, in New Jersey, and the most I knew about Joseph Bonaparte was that he existed. So basically, my foundation of knowledge about the Napoleon that we all know was more or less established by the subject of, I believe, our second podcast, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Most of my early understanding of Napoleon is of this jerk of a Frenchman that Bill and Ted take back to modern times, who then is pushing kids to take their spots on water slides and then eating the giant ice cream that gets him called Ziggy, Ziggy Piggy, Piggy, Ziggy, Ziggy Piggy. Piggy, Ziggy Piggy. No. So I know Napoleon exists. I know there was a battle at Waterloo. I know he lost. Waterloo. I know he got sent to an island. I know he had an older brother. So that's where I'm starting. But yeah. For anybody who needs just a quick catch up on the non Bill and Ted related Napoleon slash Joseph story, 1806 Napoleon issues an imperial decree which makes Joseph the king of Naples. He stays there for a couple years. The people like him in Naples, but he gets sent over to Spain to become the king of a place that was not inclined to like him. It didn't go well. Everybody pretty much hated him, so he spent from 1808 till 1813 there before leaving the throne, going back to France. His brother gets sent to one island, comes back, gets ousted again after the defeat at Waterloo, and he's finally exiled to St. Helena off of Africa by the British forces, and he dies six years later, most likely of stomach cancer. Joseph, on the other hand, he goes over to these United States of America, and then he gets to live this charmed existence. One of his friends, Joseph Hopkinson, wrote, What dethroned monarch has been more fortunate than he to fall in such a way? Generally, they've become beggars for aid, or pensioners, or prisoners. This is a change rather than a fall. So yeah, Joseph had it pretty good at this house. He did have it pretty good. The guy that took over for him in Naples, who was actually his brother-in-law, was made king of Naples after him. He didn't fare as well. Eventually, he was executed. But Joseph was a little bit luckier, escaped Spain just in time. He recognized his time was up and got out before everybody started killing everybody. He comes over here and passes through New York City, rents a place in Philadelphia. But by 1816, he buys the property at Point Breeze, which is overlooking the Delaware River, one of the two rivers that goes through Philadelphia. It also goes up by Trenton. But he buys this property and he builds this beautiful house, later burns down, builds another house. And his house was a grand estate. It was considered maybe second only to the White House in terms of its grandness and certainly its size in the United States. So it's a pretty big deal. And in the Philadelphia Inquirer, there's a man named Kevin Reardon who wrote an article in January of 2021 saying the former king of Spain was a Jersey guy. And the beginning of his article was actually really nice. So listen to this. This describes Joseph Bonaparte's house. At the crest of a windswept bluff overlooking the confluence of Crosswicks Creek and the Delaware River and Border Town, Joseph Bonaparte, older brother of Napoleon, former king of Spain, self-exiled diplomat, and Philadelphia resident, built a country estate called Point Breeze that was a wonder of early 19th century America. Only the White House was larger than Bonaparte's first residence on Point Breeze, where his collections of paintings, books, and birds were also among the best and brightest in the young United States. Swan boats glided on the half-mile-long lake he created. Tulip poplars rose skyward from a carefully curated picturesque landscape that he designed and whose style he helped popularize. 
And then it goes on from there. There he becomes this high society socialite type guy, very popular, not just with the rich folks, but the town folks as well, who actually during that first fire, they all race into his house once they can't put the fire out to save his paintings, save all these possessions that he had. And it was said of him, well, I have two quotes that I like to give us a little bit of an idea of who this man is, what he's like. First off, Napoleon himself, while in exile in 1817, said about his older brother, Joseph, Joseph, though he has much talent and genius, is too good a man and too fond of amusement and literature to be a king. So he goes to the United States. He's having a nice time. And another person looked on to Joseph and said that his manners were full of grace, elegance, and blandness. His heart was full of humane feelings. His mind was well balanced. And all his views on life were moderate and cheerful. So let me ask you, Brad, if you could be friends with one of these two Bonaparte brothers that we spent time talking about so far, which would you choose? I think I would have to go with Joseph. Yeah, of those two. Totally going with Joseph. Napoleon seems to have this complex that a short person would have. Oh, I can't think of a good name for that. But anyway, I would have to go with Joseph as well. Yeah. He must have hated his brother Lucien, though, because Lucien was between Joseph and Louis Bonaparte, and Lucien didn't get a kingship, but mm. Joseph and Louis and Jérôme all did. Interesting. I did notice that Jérôme had two sons, one named Jérôme Napoleon Charles, and a second son named Napoleon, who was known as Plan Plan. Plan Plan. Plan Plan is a good name. I like Plan Plan. Guess what I found out, brother? What did you find out? When Joseph went to the United States of America, you know who he didn't take? His wife. He didn't take his wife or their children. He spends parts of the years 1816 through the early 1830s living most of the time at this place in New Jersey, although he did have another property in New York. And eventually he moves to London in the 1830s, comes back for the last time in the late 1830s. But that's just to visit. He eventually has a stroke moves to Florence where he can live with his wife, and she did not hold it against him that he had affairs. She said that she loved him in spite of his adulterous behavior. And in 1844, he dies, but he leaves behind this estate. It's passed down to a grandchild and sold and goes through a couple transitions. The houses are torn down. These days, the property just sold, and the article I originally had seen was in Smithsonian Magazine talked about this estate being sold by a Catholic missionary group who had run the property for a number of decades, sold it off to this combined force of the state of New Jersey, the town of Bordentown, New Jersey, and this other organization. They converted about 55 to 60 acres of this 1800 acre original land that he would have owned. And the town of Bordentown is getting a few of the buildings to use for their local government. This other organization is taking care of some of the gardener's buildings, which are the only circa 1820 buildings or before that are still remaining. And the rest of it is going to be turned into a state park. But the gardens, bridges, miles of paths. In the house, he had the largest library in the United States with over 8,000 volumes. He had many of his other possessions shipped over. It was quite the estate. But the land and only a portion of that land is all we have left. And that's going to be some place that people can visit if they're in that neighborhood, which I think is lovely. Well, that answered a question. I had looked up a listing of the oldest and the most important estates in New Jersey, and Point Breeze was not listed on that list at all. And so it explains it to me a little bit because it wasn't there. But what was on there was Drum Thwacket. Drum Thwacket sounds cool. Drum Thwacket is the governor's residence in New Jersey. Hmm. And I thought, oh, that's a cool name. I'm going to go look up the other governor's mansions in the other U.S. states to see <laughs> if any of them are cool like that. And frankly, they're not. Oh, well. I mean, you've got Governor House in Maryland, so at least they took the S off. Mm. M maybe that's better. I don't know. I like the Governor's Palace in Colonial Williamsburg because it has swords hung all over the wall. I have an important question before you get back to your thing, though, Brad. Okay. Swords, swords has a W in it, which we don't really use. I'll take swords. I'll take swords. But there's a W in it. Knife has a, a K in it that we don't really use, right? Yeah. Why do probably the two foremost types of cutting things both have a silent letter? Well, and the people who use the swords and knives, the Knigets, mm. the English Knigets, they also don't have a pronunciation of the letter in their name. 
I don't know. Other than to say the English language is hard to learn for no apparent reason. True. We have 44 sounds and only 26 symbols. If we had 44 symbols for our 44 sounds, then our language would be so much easier to learn and we wouldn't have so many people who are illiterate or have trouble at reading. Brad, I'm sorry I asked you. The one thing I would say is that maybe the reason people can't read is because they never got to go to a special school for kids who can't read good. <laughs> Yes. Yes. The only other thing I was going to say about the governor's mansion is the not quite state of Puerto Rico has a good name for their mansion because their mansion is actually called La Fortaleza. Mm. And it also is the oldest continuously used government building in the Americas, La Fortaleza. I like that. Well, Brad, if you remember earlier in the podcast, I talked about the swan boats that Joseph Bonaparte used on his property. Do you remember me saying that? I do remember you saying that. I also remember seeing swan boats in Boston. Yeah. Obviously, as a person who lived in Boston, swan boats, that was a term that threw me back to Boston Public Garden as well. But it got me thinking about swan boats. And the first thing I want to know is, Brad, if you were to build a man-made lake on your property and then to put a boat within that lake, what animal would you like to have prominently featured on your boat? Turtles all the way down. Turtles all the way down? That's a uh, a metaphor for the formation of the earth, you know. Oh. Turtles all the way down. I believe you talked about it in a previous podcast. Oh, yeah. I did talk about that in our episode about the uh, preacher without vocal cords. Oh, excellent. Well, I did start to wonder why swan boats. Because if you would choose a turtle. I would. For your animal. I would probably choose a donkey. Hmm. There's obviously a choice being made when people choose a swan boat. In Boston, it was actually chosen for a very specific reason. What was that reason? This is venturing a little bit off the beaten path, but we're talking about the very end of the 19th century. There's a Boston family. The descendants of that original family are still running the swan boats in the Boston Public Garden to this day. You can go pay a few dollars and ride them anytime that it's not winter there in Boston. But the boats in Boston, basically this guy creates a boat is the late 1800s, so bicycles are becoming a really big deal. He wants to have this boat propelled by a bicycle, which it was then, and it now is, but he didn't want people to be looking at the bicycle. So he says, let's cover it up. Let's make a swan. A swan is not only pretty, but he was inspired by the opera Lohengrin, which was a Wagner opera, basically a Germanic version of the Arthurian legend. Because the opera Lohengrin was based on a medieval German story in which Lohengrin, a knight of the grail, crosses a river in a boat drawn by a swan to defend the innocence of Princess Elsa. Not of Arendelle, but Princess Elsa nonetheless. He basically says that he will protect her as she rises to power as long as she never asks his name or where he comes from. Brad. If I had to ask you to take two guesses as to what questions Elsa eventually asked Lohengrin, what do you think they would be? Do you want to build a snowman? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And uh, how many carrots does a reindeer eat? Well, those are correct answers, but they're correct answers in a different opera, not a Wagnerian opera. In the Wagnerian opera, she actually does ask him, who are you? And where are you from? A lot like Admiral Stockdale, who asked, Who am I? Why am I here? Put a pin in that one, audience. We might have an exciting Admiral Stockdale episode coming up in the future. (laughs) But fun fact about the Lohengrin opera, Brad, that is where the popular song most Americans know as Here Comes the Bride is actually the bridal chorus from Wagner's 1850 opera. What do you think about that? I don't have much to say about that other than I believe Wagner was an anti-Semite, and so I'm not a big fan. Mm. Yeah. Did you know that one of the Bonaparte descendants, Charles Joseph Bonaparte, joined the presidential cabinet of Teddy Roosevelt? I didn't know that. He was a secretary of the Navy and an attorney general. Well, he had better luck than Joseph did. When Joseph came over, he was actually on his way down to meet President Madison. And Madison had sent a representative, which I think was actually Monroe, to stop him just south of Baltimore and say, no, dude, we can't be hanging out with Bonapartists. It's not a good look. Why don't you head on back home? Did Monroe step off his horse and start reading his doctrine to Joseph? I would have. Yeah. I assume he just carried it around in his pocket and just read it to people all the time. Like, oh, my God, 
there's Monroe again. He's going to read that stupid doctrine. <laughs> he just can't help himself. Well, one thing that I really liked is that after Joseph came to the United States, he had already been the king of uh, Naples. He had already been a king of Spain. And there were some Mexican revolutionaries who wanted to offer him the potential crown in Mexico. Do you know what Joseph said? I don't know what he said other than no. Yeah, so it was no, but it was a really beautiful way that he said it. He said, I have worn two crowns. I would not take a step to wear a third. Every day that I pass in the hospitable land of the United States proves more clearly to me the excellence of Republican institutions for America. Keep them, then, as a precious gift from heaven. USA! 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 Oh, USA! 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 Anyway, do you know who else was exiled to Jersey? Um... The New York Giants and New York Jets. Good answers, but trick question. Oh. Victor Hugo was exiled to Jersey, but Jersey, the Channel Island. Well played. <laughs> well, then he moved to Guernsey, where he uh, wrote Les Mis while in exile. Mm. Going back to Joseph turning down, he wasn't really offered the chance to be a, a king in Mexico, but turning down a potential opportunity... Have you heard that whole thing about George Washington being offered the chance to be king? I haven't, but I did think about that a little bit when I was reading through the history of the Napoleons and Joseph and yeah. all that. I mean, that, that nepotism there and how lucky we were that Washington was our first president. Sure. I mean, he had kids, but he didn't have his own, you know, didn't have his own sons. And so even when John Quincy Adams followed John Adams, it wasn't hereditary rule. He had to earn it a bit, sure. at least. Well, there's this whole thing in history of George Washington being offered the chance to be king. And I was wondering about how many different people have been given the opportunity or floated out in some formal sense uh, with the opportunity to take a throne, uh, whatever the case may be. And I couldn't really find a lot of evidence of people turning that down. I'm sure it's happened, but I couldn't find anybody who had aggregated that in a way that I could really get a sense of it. But I had always heard this thing about George Washington. He could have been king. And it seemed like it was more just a theoretical thing. The closest thing it seems like we actually got to that being floated around is that there was a colonel in the army, an Irish-born military veteran, older guy, 65 years old at the period of time that we had won the revolution, but the states are in charge, were finding it impossible to pay the soldiers from the revolution because the Articles of Confederation didn't give any federal entity the power to do any of the taxing or anything that would enable us to pay. So, of course, there were soldiers saying, hey, this is a problem, but this one colonel named Louis Nicola, he actually wrote to Washington with a letter in which he danced around floating this idea. You get very much the sense that he knows George isn't going to go for this. In fact, he's probably going to hate this, but maybe if I say it right, it's going to be okay. So Nicola writes, some people have so connected the ideas of tyranny and monarchy as to find it very difficult to separate them. It may therefore be requisite to give the head of such a constitution as I propose some title apparently more moderate. But if all other things were once adjusted, I believe strong arguments might be produced for admitting the title of king, which I concede would be attended with some material advantages. This man was writing from Fishkill, New York in 1782. George Washington turns around and responds on the day that he receives the note. He says to Nicola, be assured, sir, no occurrence in the course of war has given me more painful sensations that your information of there being such ideas existing in the army as you have expressed, and I must view with abhorrence and reprehend with severity. He also says, I am much at a loss to conceive what part of my conduct could have given encouragement to an address which to me seems big with the greatest mischiefs that can befall my country. If I am not deceived in the knowledge of myself, you could not have found a person to whom your schemes are more disagreeable. George Washington stomped that guy down with his fancy riding boots and his sports pants that he always wore around. And he said, you back off, Nicola. You don't get a king. I ain't going to be a king. And you're wrong. That was an epic response. And he had quite a few of those if you read his letters. Well, you know that George Washington had a chair that had foot pedals. And when you move the foot pedals, a fan went back and forth over his head. 
he could sit and write letters at length in the humidity of Virginia or wherever he happened to be in great comfort, especially given that I'm sure his uniform was a high performance fabric. It sounds like he was also basically uh, doing a step climber and getting exercise at the same time. And since the calf muscle was one of the biggest turn-ons for the ladies because you put your best foot forward to show off your calf muscle because the people who rode horses had money and had good calves, George Washington, by working his fan chair, would have had like the biggest calves in the business. They also say that in current day, the calf muscle is the last of the muscles to lose its shape as you grow older. So older people have better calves, and it's their best feature as they get older. And aging George Washington could have therefore stopped Colonel Louis Nicola. And looked good while doing it because his calves were worked out on his foot pedal. Amen. The rest of the people that I saw turning down the throne were doing so after already having the throne. They were abdicating. Well, let me ask you, how many royal abdications across planet Earth do you think there have been since the year 1900? Since the year 1900. And this is as of 2014, according to PBS. There's been several in the last few years, yeah. I'll give you a grace period of a few, because, you know. 37. Nope. You're well, it's 36. (laughs) That's incredible. I had no idea. In terms of abdication trivia, you have proved every bit as adept as my wife Shannon is at guessing the Rotten Tomatoes score on movies after we've watched them. She can nail those every time. Well, hopefully she would win even by a Price is Right's rules because I would have lost by Price is Right's rules. Hmm. From the year 1900 to 2014, 36 royal abdications, according to PBS. Hmm. 20 of them were traditional, meaning a person abdicates and usually a family member takes over. Right. Eight of them were for monarchies that were abolished. Therefore, there was an abdication. Seven of them were for rulers forced into exile. And one person was from a country that ceded into another existing monarchy. Those were the abdications. Hmm. All right, Brother Brad. I would say that we've exhausted this topic, but there's one man that we haven't heard from yet. And even though he's never been exiled to New Jersey, I'm sure he would love to go there and visit every college campus. His name is Father Art, and we're going to ask him some questions. Name one person or thing in some way related to New Jersey for which you would like to create a park. Just the uh, general Jersey Shore accent. I think they uh, they ought to have their own park to honor their, their way of speech. If you suddenly learned that a historic figure's sibling once owned an estate next door to you and it was going to be turned into a state park, which historical figure's sibling would you want it to be? Hmm. Boy. Probably George Washington. George Washington have siblings? I don't know. I don't either. I don't think so. That's a good question. I I don't know. As a state park enthusiast, which park do you consider to be your favorite and why? Hmm. I like most of the Ohio state parks, I guess. My favorite would be Mohican. I like the um, topographic variety there and uh, just the uh, general overall appearance of the place. If you were ever to be sent to exile because one of your siblings had run a country to the point where they no longer wanted him, which country would you have chosen to go into exile to? Obviously, Canada, because I I have some family roots there, and I like their national anthem. Joseph Bonaparte had swan boats on the small man-made lake on his property. If you had a man-made lake and needed to commission your own boat, what animal or other object would you choose to feature instead of swans? I would like a Canada goose boat. (laughs) They're a menace, Dad. (laughs) I know. That's why I would like. I'd be able to annoy people and keep them from coming on my property. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we're prepared to say right now about the Unabomber, Sam Houston, Point Breeze, Waterloo, Will Hunting, Alluring Calf Muscles, and Potential Mexican Kings. 
But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there will be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked or what you didn't like, or to tell us about something that we got totally wrong. You might even have enough time to tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. And if you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of Druyards will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. I was going to text you this because I thought it was awesome. So apparently when Zlatan went to the LA Galaxy to play in America, yeah. he told his wife to go out and um, buy a furnished apartment. And she's, she went out and she found a perfect apartment. And she knew he wanted it furnished, but the one that she found that she really liked wasn't furnished. So she told him that. And he's like, okay, just go get some furniture. He said, go to Ikea or he pronounced it differently, so probably the right way. He said, go to Ikea and get some furniture. And he said that a broker then told him that rich people don't buy their furniture at Ikea. But Zlatan said, yeah, but smart people do. <laughs> He's so weird. <laughs> I loved yeah. it. He's so weird. <laughs>